Hi team, I'm here to make two videos. This is the first of two videos that you're gonna be watching today. This first video is gonna be a little lengthy, but I wanna review the reading that y'all did for your homework in preparation for the reading quiz that you're going to be doing today. So everyone should have their books out and everyone should also have the chapter one handout. And then everyone should also have post-its. So I'm going to be moving kind of quickly through the review of the reading because you should have read to page 24 for your reading quiz today. So I'm going to move pretty quickly and you should be jotting down notes on the post-its as I do this review with you. All right. Um, background with the book. I told you guys this in class on Friday. I'm going to tell you it one more time. Gabriel Garcia Marquez was inspired by real life events to write this book. This book is not truth. He was inspired by real life events. So let me explain that really quickly. His mom was like, hey, there was a murder that happened in my town. Um, somebody murdered this man who had relations with a teacher and everyone was talking about the murders before they happened. And so he was like, okay, yeah, like murder is interesting. We talked about that in class on Friday. But the more interesting thing was the collective responsibility that these people had to prevent the murder from happening, yet no one did anything. So he took that idea of the collective responsibility of the town, and then he applied it to this book. So this book is going to be the telling of the murder of Santiago Nasser. And the narrator of the book, we're never going to learn the narrator's name, but the narrator is from the same town that Santiago Nasser lived. He's going to leave the town, come back 27 years later, talk to people who were associated or connected to the murder in some way or the murdered man, and he's going to put together the pieces. And so he's not going to put together the pieces in a way that's going to be judgmental. He's going to keep that um, kind of like a documentary style or news reporting style of these events, where he wants you, the reader, to process and go through the back and forth of, okay, is this person responsible? Is it um, part of the collective responsibility for why they're responsible? Um, maybe what was like the, the like line of processing or the line of thinking that was going through their head when they did or didn't do something. And then he's also going to give us different points of view. So just like a documentary will kind of lay out the problem that they're going to be talking about. And then it would turn to people who would give their testimonies of what happened on the day of the crime, the scene of the event. Um, this book is going to do the same thing. So that's what we're going to be putting post-its in our book um, for today. Okay, so remember that in class on Friday, we started reading chapter one and that it started off with the fact that we knew that Santiago Nasser is going to get murdered or that he was murdered. Um, so that's where he already breaks with the genre of a novel. And it's more of news reporting because with the novel, it would be all of the events that led up to the murder. The murder would be the big conflict or the big event. And then there would be resolution for the town afterward. Marquez doesn't give us any of that. He starts us off with the problem. Um, and it's actually not the real problem of the book. The problem of the book is deciding how responsible the people of the city are for the murder of Santiago Nasser. Okay, so remember we started with the dream. His mom was talking about how she thinks that she's really good at interpreting dreams, but then she didn't accurately interpret the dream that he told her that he had on the day that he was murdered. So let's turn our page to page four. Um, we already get a little bit of like not clarity um, or like unclear processing or maybe the imprecise nature of our memory with the mom and how she's telling the story because the mom is like, oh yeah, he told me this dream. I'm usually really good at processing dreams, but then the mom wasn't able to predict that he got murdered. So we're already, the little red flag should be up and be like, okay, how truthful are these people who are retelling this story of the day that Santiago Nasser was murdered? Okay, page four. Put a little post-it there and look in the very middle of the page. And it says, furthermore, all the people he ran into after leaving his house at five minutes past six and until he was carved up like a pig an hour later, remembered him as being a little sleepy, but in a good mood. And he remarked to all of them in a casual way that it was a very beautiful day. No one was certain if he was referring to the state of the weather. 
Many people coincided in recalling that it was a radiant morning with a sea breeze coming in through the banana groves, as was to be expected on a fine February of that period. But most agree that the weather was most funereal. The cloudy low sky and the thick smell of still waters and that at the moment of misfortune, a thin drizzle was falling like the one Santiago Nasser had been in, had seen in his dream grove. All right, we already got another split that's going on. Remember that they... He go, the narrator goes back to the town 27 years later to talk to these people. So we don't know how accurate their memories are. We don't know how skewed their memory is because they're trying to protect themselves as well. And we already see that right off the bat when they're not even talking about anything as controversial or harmful um, or terrible as murder. They're just talking about the weather. Santiago Nasser, people are like, oh yeah, he was commenting on what a good day it was. But then some people are also saying, you know what? It was February. It wasn't that good of weather. It was actually kind of drizzling. Okay, now turn your book to page five. We read this page in class on Friday, but we know that um, he works at a cattle ranch. And it's a cattle ranch. If you look in the kind of middle of that paragraph, the cattle ranch is called the Divine Face. Um, and it was a cattle ranch, ranch that he inherited from his father in which he administered with very good judgment, but without much luck. In the country, he wore, and then it goes through and talks about all of the different guns that he has. So we know that he likes guns. He likes to carry guns. He uses falconry equipment because, remember, he uses a falcon that he has trained to go and hunt for whatever it is that he's hunting for. The falcon kills it and then brings it back to him. Um. Okay, and then there's also some more irony that's being crafted here in that we know that Santiago Nasser is a hunter, and then before his murder, he is going to get hunted by his murderers. Okay. So the narrator is just revealing the conversations that he had primarily with Santiago Nasser's mother, Placido Linera, um, and that she's remembering him in a very specific way. And I want you to think about like what bias your mom would have in remembering you. And also think about why the narrator starts this book off with the mother's perspective. So let's look at page seven, the very last paragraph. It says, I saw him in her memory. He had turned 21 the last week in January. So he's 21 when he's murdered. And he was slim and pale and had his father's Arab eyelids and curly hair. He was the only child of a marriage of convenience without a single moment of happiness. Okay, important to note here. Marriage between Placida, uh, Placida Lanero and Ibrahim Nasser, not a good relationship. Marriage of convenience. Also, Placida Lanera is from that town that she's living in right now. Ibrahim Nasser is an outsider who came to Mexico, Central America, because he was essentially a refugee from the Ottoman Empire. All right, um, let's keep reading this paragraph. But he seemed happy with his father until the latter died suddenly three years before, and he continued seeming to be so with his solitary mother until the Monday of his death. From her, he had inherited a sixth sense. Okay, so from his mom, he had a sixth sense, but we don't know if that's so true because he doesn't predict that he's going to get murdered. From his father, he learned at a very early age the manipulation of firearms, his love for horses, and the mastery of high-flying birds of prey, falcons in particular. But from him, he also learned the good arts of valor and prudence. Okay, remember, this is the mom talking to the narrator about how she remembers her son. Think about the bias that you might have for how you would talk about your son that you love and care about. Um, and so she paints him in a very specific way. So I want you to be able to think about and then be able to articulate later for your quiz. What is she emphasizing about him? And if you look at the words of valor, meaning brave, and then prudence of like, um, you're very closed off, you're very deliberate in the decisions that you make and how much you reveal and show. Um, Think about that. They, meaning the father and Santiago Nasser, spoke Arabic between themselves, but not in front of Placido Lanero, so that she wouldn't feel excluded. 
Okay, we also get these little hints that maybe Santiago Nasser was an outsider and that he wasn't fully accepted by this town. Um, so like we get hints at it. It's not said explicitly, um, but I want you to hold on to that information while we read other people's perspectives. Okay, turn the page to page eight. The very last sentence of that first paragraph, it says, by his nature, Santiago Nasser was merry and peaceful and open-hearted. Remember, this is the mom telling her perspective of how she remembers and how she sees her son. All right, let's skip down to the bottom of the page. We're introduced to a new perspective. So imagine that the narrator is finished with his time talking to Placido Linera and is like, I'm going to go talk to other people in the area that remember him. And the next person that he goes to is a woman named Victoria Guzman, and she's the cook in the Nasser household. All right. She actually, let's skip over to the next page. Um, and we're going to look near. Oh, sorry. Let's look in like near the top of the page on the right hand side where it says he always got up with the face of a bad night. So page nine. He always got up with the face of a bad night, also meaning that he's hungover. Victoria Guzman recalled without affection. Okay, so she is recalling him and the narrator is sure to note that she has no affection for Santiago Nasser. So think about that. Davina Flor, her daughter, who is just coming into bloom. Um, and there's a metaphor that's being used here where Davina Flor um, is Victoria Guzman's daughter. And that she, as a young woman, is being compared to a flower who is blooming. So she's probably in her like uh she's probably like around the age of 13 or 14 years old where she's just starting to go through puberty so she served Nas Santiago Nasser a mug of mountain coffee with a shot of cane liquor as on every Monday to help him bear the burden of the night before the enormous kitchen with the whispers from the fire and the hens sleeping on their perches was breathing stealthily Santiago Nasser swallowed another aspirin and sat down to drink the mug of coffee in slow sips thinking just as slowly without taking his eyes off the two women who were disemboweling the rabbits on the stove. So Davina Floor, daughter, Victoria Guzman, mother, they are gutting rabbits right now. In spite of her age, Victoria Guzman was still in good shape. The girl, as yet a bit untamed, seemed overwhelmed by the drive of her glands. All right, so there's some very suggestive language there in that Davina Floor is untamed, overwhelmed by the drive of her glands, meaning that she's like hormonal. Um, Santiago Nasser grabbed her by the wrist when she came to take the empty mug from him. The time has come for you to be tamed, he told her. Okay, think about what is implied there and then think about how that looks. We know that Santiago Nasser is 21 years old. We know that Davina Flor is like 13, 14 years old. He grabs her by the wrist and he tells her that she needs to be tamed. Think about what he wants to do to her. Okay, then it says, Victoria Guzman showed him the bloody knife because remember, she's, gut she's gutting rabbits right now. She says, let go of her, white man. She ordered him seriously. You won't have a drink of that water as long as I'm alive. So Victoria Guzman threatens him. And then Victoria Guzman also compares her own daughter to a glass of water. If you've ever heard that expression of someone being a tall glass of water and that you want to like drink them or take them all in, Victoria Guzman is like, uh-uh, you ain't having any of my daughter. Okay, and now we know why as we move into this next paragraph. She'd been seduced by Ibrahim Nasser, Santiago's father, in the fullness of her adolescence. She'd made love to him in secret for several years in the stables of the ranch, and he brought her to be a house servant when the affection was over. Davina Flor was the daughter of a more recent mate, knew that she was destined for Santiago Nasser's furtive bed, and that idea brought out a premature anxiety in her. All right, so we're kind of getting a little bit of a hint that there's like this um, seduction that kind of runs through the family or this like womanizing attitude that runs through the family and that Victoria Guzman used to have an affair with Santiago Nasser's father, Ibrahim. And now Davina Flor feels like she is supposed to sleep with Santiago Nasser at some point. All right. Um, another man like that hasn't ever been born again, she told me, fat and faded and surrounded by the children of other loves. He was just like his father, Victoria Guzman answered her, a shit. 
but she couldn't avoid a wave of fright as she remembered Santiago Nasser's horror when she pulled out the insides of a rabbit by the roots and threw the steaming guts to the dogs. All right, skip down to two more paragraphs. Victoria Guzman needed almost 20 years to understand that a man accustomed to killing defenseless animals could suddenly express such horror. All right, so Victoria Guzman is having her time remembering Santiago Nasser. She does not remember him very fondly, um, and she's also very protective over her daughter. So hold on to that. That's the next perspective that we get. Um, skip over to page 11. Um, it's going to describe how the Nasser family ended up in this area. Um, he's an Arab man. Um, at the very top of the page, they essentially describe how he came here as part of or fleeing from the civil wars that were happening in um, the Middle East. So they describe the house. They describe what, where Placido Lanera would sit. And then Let's turn to page 12. In the middle of the page, that first full paragraph, it says no one could understand such fatal coincidences. So remember, as they're putting together the pieces 27 years later, they're having a really hard time figuring out like what was coincidence, what was real, who's to blame, who's not to blame, who can we excuse for the murder of this man? Okay. Uh, next paragraph at the very beginning, it says Victoria Guzman, for her part, had been categorical with her answer that neither she nor her daughter knew that the men were waiting for Santiago Nasser to kill him. Okay, so initially she was like, I didn't know that those men were going to kill Santiago Nasser. But in the course of her years, she admitted that both knew it when he came into the kitchen to have his coffee. They had been told it by a woman who had passed by after five o'clock to beg for a bit of milk and who, in addition, had revealed the motives and the place where they were waiting. All right, so we get this detail here. This detail is that a woman came by the cattle ranch, asked for milk from the cattle ranch, and had also dropped this little bit of information. Hey, guess what? Santiago Nasser is going to get murdered today. Okay, hold on to that little detail for another character that we're going to be introduced to here in a little bit. Okay, skip over to page 13. I didn't warn him because I thought it was drunkard's talk, she told me. Nevertheless, Davina Flora confessed to me on a later visit after her mother had died that the latter hadn't said anything to Santiago Nasser because in the depths of her heart, she wanted them to kill him. So Davina Flora is like, yeah, my mom wanted him to be murdered. So that's why she didn't stop the murder from happening. She, on the other hand, didn't warn him because she was nothing but a frightened child at the time, incapable of a decision of her own. And she'd been all the more frightened when he grabbed her by the wrist with a hand that felt frozen and stony, like the hand of a dead man. Okay. So she's also like, he wouldn't have believed me way back when because I was just a child. Okay, let's skip to page 14. About the middle of the paragraph, sentence starts on the right-hand side of the page. It says, someone who was never identified had shoved an envelope under the door with a piece of paper warning Santiago Nasser that they were waiting for him to kill him. And in addition, the note revealed the place, the motive, and other quite precise details of the plot. The message was on the floor when Santiago left home, but he didn't see it, nor did Davina Flor or anyone else until long after the crime had been consummated. And you should have little red flags going off where it's like, okay, Davina Floor and um, Victoria Guzman, they didn't tell him this information, but there was also a note that was sl slid under the door. And, you know, Santiago Nasser, he might not have seen it because we know that he was hung over from the wedding he attended the night before. Um, but also Davina Floor and Victoria Guzman didn't see the note that was slid under the door. Okay. Now, hope you held on to that little bit of information about the woman who asked for a bit of milk. Let's look at the very bottom of the page on 14. The only place open on the square was a milk shop on one side of the church where the two men, where the two men were who were waiting for Santiago Nasser in order to kill him. All right, so there's this milk shop or a milk store and there's two men waiting outside to kill him. Clotilda Armenta, the proprietress or the owner of the establishment, was the first to see him in the glow of dawn, and she had the impression that he was dressed in aluminum, because remember, he's in all white. 
He already looked like a ghost, she told me. The men who were going to kill him had slept on the benches, clutching the knives, wrapped in newspapers to their chest, and Clotilda Armenta held her breath so as to not awaken them. Okay. The murderers fell asleep on a bench, knives wrapped in newspapers, holding them to their chest. Imagine that you are Clotilda Armenta and you wake up at dawn, okay, 4.35, 5 a.m., um, and you go and you walk to your store that you own and you see these men who are passed out. Okay, you might avoid them. You might you might walk on the other side of the street. Okay, next paragraph. They were twins, Pedro and Pablo Vicario. They were 24 years old and they looked so much alike that it was difficult to tell them apart. They were hard looking, um, it's like tough looking, but of a good sort, the report said. Okay, so this is also where it's revealed that the narrator goes and looks at all of the police reports to help him put all these pieces together. So again, combination of him going and interviewing people in the town, hearing how they remember the event, and then him also reading reports that were taken on the day and days after the murder being committed. All right, let's move down, or sorry, let's keep reading. Um, I, who had known them since grammar school, would have written the same thing. Okay, so he's kind of like, oh yeah, I agree with the way that these people are being described. That morning, they were still wearing their dark wedding suits, too heavy and formal for the Caribbean. And they looked, because remember that the Caribbean is like kind of damp, kind of warm, and they're wearing these dark formal suits. And they looked devastated by so many hours of bad living. Okay, so they like haven't been up to any good for the last couple of hours um, or a lot of hours because it says so many, but they'd done their duty and shaved. Although they hadn't stopped drinking since the eve of the wedding, so they're very drunk, or they they spent a lot of time drinking, and then here's where a contradictory detail comes in. They weren't drunk at the end of three days, but they looked rather like insomniac sleepwalkers. And remember that if you're an insomniac, you can't sleep, and a sleepwalker is someone who walks in their sleep. So it's like this contradictory information that is being given to us, but you can imagine maybe why you wouldn't trust these men if you were to walk by them on a bit and see them on a bench. Um, they'd fallen asleep with the first breezes of dawn after almost three hours of waiting in Clotilda Armenta's store. And it was the first sleep that they had had since Friday. They had barely awakened on the first bellow of the boat, but instinct awoke them completely when Santiago Nasser came out of his house. Then they both grabbed and rolled up newspapers and Pedro Vicario started to get up. For the love of God, murmured Clotilda Armenta, leave him for later, if only out of respect for his grace, the bishop. Okay, so this bishop is coming in on a boat to visit the town, and Clotilda is like, please do not murder him in front of this bishop. Please at least wait for him to leave. Um, so Cl Clotilda knows that these men want to murder Santiago Nasser. We also know it because she went to the Nasser's home and told them when she went there to try to get milk from the cattle ranch. Um, and so what do you all think? Is she, is she to blame for the reason that this murder happened or is Victoria Guzman and Davina Flor, are they to blame for the murder that has happened or is Santiago Nasser maybe to blame himself for himself getting murdered or does the blame solely fall on the Vicario twins or probably what Marquez wants us to believe is that everyone had their own part in being an accomplice in the murder of Santiago Nasser. Okay, let's skip over to page 18. Um, they go through the fact that there was this wedding that had happened um, and there was lots of alcohol there. People indulged, people had a good time. And then Santiago is thinking about this and he says, that's what I want my wedding to be like, he said. Life will be too short for people to tell about it. Um, and like, this is another form of irony in that he's saying that his life is going to be short and we know that he gets murdered that day. So his life is going to be real short. My sister felt the angel pass by. And when you look at that sentence, I want you to think about um, like what angel? And then you should think to yourself, oh, it's the angel of death. So the narrator is now bringing in his sister's perspective. She thought once more about the good fortune of Flora Miguel, who had so many things in life and was going to have Santiago Nasser. 
So his sister's like, oh my God, this girl, Flora Miguel, she's so lucky. She's got so many things. And now she's also going to get Santiago Nasser um, on Christmas of that year. So it kind of sounds like Santiago Nasser was getting ready to get married himself later that year. Um, and then this is the sister who talks next. I suddenly realized that there couldn't have been a better catch than him, she told me. Just imagine, handsome, a man of his word, and with a fortune of his own at the age of 21. She used to invite him to have breakfast at our house when there were Manoic fritters and my mother was making them making some that morning. Santiago Nasser accepted with enthusiasm. Okay, so this is where things get kind of complicated because now we know that Santiago Nasser has a connection to the family and it's the narrator's sister. Um, we also know that there's like, more family connections than that? Not really clear yet. Let's keep reading. Um, he comes over and let's turn to page 20 at the very top. This is the narrator who's speculating now. And he says, no one even wondered whether Santiago Nasser had been warned because it seemed impossible to all that he hadn't. So all these people are like, oh my God, this murder is gonna happen. There's all of this writing on the walls. And everyone does kind of what a lot of people do when they're put in situations like this. They're like, someone else will do it. Someone else will take care of that. Someone else will tell him, but no one tells him. Okay, first full paragraph on page 20. In reality, my sister Margo was one of the few people who still didn't know that they were going to kill him. If I'd known, I would have taken him home with me even if I had to hogtie him, she declared to the investigator. Okay, so like now the narrator is recalling what his sister had said to the investigator. And when we think about what an investigator does, an investigator investigates people who may be associated or guilty or have connections to the event. And in this case, that event is the murder. It was strange that she hadn't known, but it was even stranger that my mother didn't know either because she knew about everything before everyone else in the house in spite of the fact that she hadn't gone out into the street in years, not even to attend mass. All right, here we get a little information about mom. Mom is a chismosa, okay? She knows everything about what's happening in town. Um, and the narrator is like, okay, it's weird that my sister didn't know, but it's even more weird that my mom is saying that she didn't know that this was happening. So the narrator is starting to doubt the words of his own family. And I want you to think about whether or not that makes the narrator more trusting, less trusting. What do you think? Okay, um, let's skip over to page 21. And about the middle of the page on the very right-hand side, on that long paragraph, it says, then it was that my sister Margot learned about it in a thorough and brutal way. Angela Vicaria, the beautiful girl who'd gotten married the day before, had been returned to the house of her parents because her husband had discovered that she wasn't a virgin. I felt that I was the one who was going to die, my sister said, but no matter how much they tossed the story back and forth, no one could explain to me how poor Santiago Nasser ended up being involved in such a mix-up. The only thing they knew for sure was that Angela Vicario's brother, brothers were waiting for him to kill him. Okay, so here's the deal. We got Angela Vicario related to Pedro and Pablo. Angela is supposed to get married. On the night of her marriage, her husband returns her, says, you are not a virgin. I do not want to marry you. Conversation that's not not embedded here, but that we can assume can happen is that the parent said, hey, who took your virginity, Angela Vicario? And what were the what was the name that came out of her mouth? But Santiago Nasser. So then the brothers are like, hey, you took my sister's honor and they plan to kill him and they do. Okay, skip to page 22. All right, more complications here. Then she told her, okay, so this is the sister telling the mom about what happened with Angela Vicario. But it was as if she already knew, she said to me. It was the same as always. You begin telling her something, and before the story is half over, she already knows how it came out. That bad news represented a, not, a naughty problem for my mother. Santiago Nasser had been named for her, okay, um, and she was his godmother when he was christened. 
So the narrator's mom is Santiago Nasser's godmother. All right. So that's how they're connected. But she was also a blood relative of Pura Vicario, the mother of the returned bride. All right. So the mom is split. She's the godmother of Santiago Nasser. She's also the blood relative of the girl whose virginity was taken, Angela Vicario. Um, nevertheless, no sooner had she heard the news than she put on her high heeled shoes in the church shawl she only wore for visits of condolence. My father, who had heard everything from his bed, appeared in the dining room in his pajamas and asked in alarm where she was going. To warn my dear friend Placido, she announced, she answered, it isn't right that everybody should know that they're going to kill her son and she the only one who doesn't. We've got the same ties to the Vicarios that we do with her, my father said. You always take the side of the dead, she said. My younger brothers began to come out of the other bedrooms. The smallest, touched by the breath of tragedy, began to weep. My mother paid no attention to them. For once in her life, she didn't even pay attention to her husband. Okay, so like this kind of furthers this like, feeling or this like dedication that women have to have to men throughout the book. We see that here. Okay. As she leaves the house to go warm Placido Lanero, she takes a step outside. And then if we turn the page to page 24, it says, until somebody who was running in the opposite direction took pity on her badness. Don't bother yourself, Luisa Santiago, he shouted as he went by. They've already killed him. And that's the end of chapter one. Okay, so the narrator has a number of things here. He has introduced us to all of these different characters. He's shown how he put together the pieces of the day. So he's like walking us through the process himself. And he is, again, not so much concerned of like who is to blame for the murder but how is the community itself to blame for this murder? Like, how are they all involved? How are they all responsible um, for what happened that day? All right, I'm gonna stop talking here about chapter one. Um, click into the next slide for the next video. Like and 